Hello, welcome to This Side of the Ceiling. I'm Kelsey. And I'm Jill. And we're two good friends trying to live this life on this side of the ceiling as abundantly as Christ has called us to. We are by no means experts, but we love to study His Word and share everything that He has revealed and taught us. So come along with us as we open up the scriptures and dive into His wonderful Word. Hello, welcome back to This Side of the Ceiling, and we are in, still in the study of David. That's right. So much to learn, so many lessons. Yeah, we want a heart after, yes. after yeah. God's own heart. Mm -hmm. It's been really good. And today we are moving on to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we are going to just start reading 2 Samuel chapter 9. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called, they called him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? Your servant, he replied. The king asked, is there, still no, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makur, son of Emiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Makur, son of Emiel. When Mephibosheth, son of da Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. I like this story. Yes. Uh, we get a break from the battlefield. <laughs> and, um, you know, in, in my Bible, the chapter before it says David's victories, and it's talking about him defeating the Philistines. And the chapter after this said David defeats Ammon in Syria. <laughs> but right in the middle, the heading is David's kindness to Mephibosheth. And you know, this story doesn't have anything to do with David's lineage. We don't learn anything that is crucial to the kingdom from here. It's just it's just an ordinary day. Um, and David's in the castle, and he wants to do something for his friend Jonathan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had made a commitment to Jonathan, and Jonathan and David had a special friendship. You know, they loved each other Um well, right, and so he he wants to do something kind for his friend, and they had made promises to each other to to care for each other's families, and so he does the research and he finds that Jonathan has a son that's crippled, and he calls him, and so I think there's obviously something in the story that God wants us to learn because He put it there, right, um, and and you know as. As we look at this, I, I kind of can't help but think think about how the way that David treats Mephibosheth because of Jonathan can be compared to the way that God treats us because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen so many comparisons in Shepherd David and right. King David yeah. and Shepherd Jesus and King Jesus. And I, I feel like so all of the Bible is teaching us about Jesus and right. teaching us about God. And we know that David had a heart that was like God's. And so I think we get a glimpse into that. Um, and I, I was thinking, you know, maybe it's a stretch to, to think of Jonathan as Jesus. But I, I want to compare a passage because, you know, 
David is going to extend this kindness to Mephibosheth, who he's never met, mm-hmm. because he loves Jonathan. And and I want to remind us what Jonathan did for him. But but to do that, I want us to first of all look at a passage in Philippians that talks about what Jesus did for us. If you'll read Philippians two, six through eight. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Okay, I want to take that passage and that's talking about Jesus. Right. um, How he humbled himself and became obedient and went to the cross. But listen to those same kind of words as I tell the story of Jonathan. Jonathan, who being by birth the son of King Saul, did not consider his right to be king as something to be used to his advantage, but rather he stripped himself of his robe, his armor, his sword and bow, and and his belt, giving them to the rightful king. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. That's what Jonathan did. Remember, he took Mm -hmm. off his kingly... um, weapons and his robe, and he gave them to David as his bond, as they made a covenant with each other. Right. And he never, you know, he was the rightful king. He was mm-hmm. the oldest son of Saul. Mm-hmm. And he never once, he, he knew that God had chosen David and he supported that. He humbled himself. Right. And so I think he was obedient to God. Um, he saw that. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, if uh, David... Jonathan is that way, and David, because of David's love for Jonathan, he's going to shower his kindness on Jonathan's son. And um, for us, because of Jesus, <laughs> our brother, mm-hmm. um, then we get that kindness of God on us because of Jesus. I, I think of uh, one way we see is that David calls him by name here. Right. Yeah. His servant Zeba doesn't call him by name. When he asks, is there anyone left in the house of Saul? He says, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. So his identity was his, his um, Weakness. inability yeah. to walk. Yeah, and Zeba's the one who knew him. He didn't right. even call him. And then yet when he walks in to the throne room, that's the first thing it says. And in my Bible, there's an exclamation point. So mm-hmm. you hear David going like, Mephibosheth, right. you know, and you wonder like, did he see Jonathan's eyes or did he, did he walk with the manner of Jonathan? I mean, maybe he didn't if he was lame, <laughs> but maybe he saw something, maybe he had a dimple or something right. that he could see his friend in his mm-hmm. child. Um, you know, it reminds me of that verse in Isaiah that says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Yeah. And we see Jesus doing that a lot. You know, it was just Easter here, and we we think about the tomb when Mary Magdalene's crying, and Jesus says, Mary. Right. You know, so there's, I remember my grandfather used to say that, you know, remember, Jill, that a person's name is the sweetest word to their ear. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. he just meant you hear it all the time. And so right. it feels like it's yours. And it feels like people know you when yeah. they say your name. Yeah. So in the same way that David called him by name, God calls us by name. He knows our name. And he invites us to eat at his table. Right. So much symbolism there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we we think about the Lord's table that we eat every um, Sunday, a lot, a lot of us, and you know, he invites us to remember, and um, it's a it's a table where we kind of are supposed to repair and prepare. You know, repair all the brokenness, remember that, and then prepare to go back out into the world the next week and fellowship and remember that we we belong at the table. Mm-hmm. You know, I think about. I remember at my again at my grandparents' house how I'd long to sit at the table. I was at the kids' table for a long time, you know. And right. you would just watch your aunts and your uncles and your moms and your dads just laughing and telling stories and right. that's still probably my favorite place is to linger at the table with, with my family and mm-hmm. tell stories and laugh and just sit around the table. Right. There's something about that. Mm-hmm. Special. Mm-hmm. 
We, when I was growing up, we sat at the table every night for dinner. It was something that we did every night. So I have good memories of the table. Yeah, me too. And I, and I realized, I thought everybody did that, but I realized they don't. Mm-hmm. Some people just pick up their lunch, go sit in front of the TV or whatever, or dinner. So I think that's a great habit to have. And, you know, Jesus even told some parables about a table. He told a parable about a banquet where he prepared a big feast and invited people and they started giving excuses right you know i need to go i just got married sorry i can't i bought some property i need to go check out i've got some oxen and you know stuff that they could have done right different time and so jesus says go out invite the lame and the Mm -hmm. blind and the people on the side of the road and his servants say we did that there's still room (laughs) And he wants, he says, well, keep going. Bring them more. I want a full table. Yeah. So I think that that was important to him. And then I also love that it, you know, that last verse you read says that Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem and he always ate at the king's table. Mm-hmm. You know, we have that promise too, that we get to live in the kingdom of God forever. Our our only Our only condition is that, we get adopted into the family through Jesus, who's mm-hmm. taking care of that. Um, but I think, you know, that was important to Jesus to eat with people. You know, he wanted to eat with Zacchaeus. And right. he told his disciples at the Last Supper, I've, I've eagerly desired to eat with you. You know, as a parent, I, I yeah. think about that. I can't wait till my family gets around that table, right. you know, and how much <laughs> how much thought you put into what we're going to eat and what we're going to do so mm-hmm. that— you eagerly desire that. And, and Jesus longs for us to be at his table. And David longed for Mephibosheth to be at his table. Right. I wonder what that would have been like for Mephibosheth to go from wherever he had been mm-hmm. to all of a sudden he's at the king's table. Right. And people, I'm sure people are like, how did you get that? And he goes, <laughs> Look, well, my dad, he's a friend of my dad. Right. You know, and so that's how we're there. You know, mm-hmm. why? Are, how do we get to go in? To that table of the Lord's well, because we're a friend of His Son, right? You know, He knows mm-hmm. us. Yeah, and this story really makes me reminds me of Colossians three. Um, it's a chapter that's special to our family, but the part of Colossians three where it says clothe what to clothe yourself with it says therefore in chapter three verse twelve, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You know, David was very kind, but David was holy and dearly loved right. by God, and he knew that he was holy and dearly loved. And when when you know that you are holy and dearly loved, you can give that to other people. And so David was clothing himself with kindness. I, I love that that uh, verb there in Colossians 3 about clothing yourselves because it's something you put on and you don't take it off. (laughs) You're Mm -hmm. wearing it. So it's something that David wore. He wore kindness, and you can see it in this story. But, you know, I uh, had listened to another podcast. I don't even remember who it was, but they were talking about how what the kindness did in this story for Mephibosheth and the way David showed his kindness. And it included, it wasn't exclusive. So if we're kind to people, we include everyone. We don't look and become exclusive. And, of course, Mephibosheth... Ziba doesn't call him by name. You would think mm-hmm. the king could exclude people, but the king doesn't. The king includes everyone. And then it also, you know, David was following through with his promise to Jonathan. He was faithful. Yeah, he was faithful to that promise, and his kindness followed through. His kindness fulfilled what he had told someone else um, that he would do. And then... His kindness also transformed, like you said, it changed Mephibosheth. So his kindness to Mephibosheth changed who he was. It changed his identity Mm -hmm. of who he was. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this kindness that we read about David and kind of in the middle of his battles (laughs) um, is a sweet story of, I mean, this warrior, this king showing sincere kindness yeah. I also think there's something to the fact that Mephibosheth, uh, 
is lame just because it's like he brings nothing to the table. Right. He does. It's not like he can say, oh, sure, I'll come. What would you like me to bring? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he he has to be cared for, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the same way, we don't bring anything to the table. No. We, Isn't it Jesus that said to invite people that can't invite you back? Right, right. Because that's, and that's just another thing. We can't do anything for him. Right. And yet he, he says, come. Mm-hmm. You know, and and he takes our little whatever fish and loaves and multiplies right. it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's not about what you bring. It's that you're willing to come. And those, you know, that you don't make an excuse like the people in the parable did. Um, I think that's the takeaway from this, too, is to not only see David's kindness, but to realize that that kindness is being offered to us right. uh, in the Lord. And I, I think we should... Remind ourselves by listening to this verse in, in Peter, Second Peter, uh, chapter three, verse nine. It says, "The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some of you count slowness, but He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would reach repentance." Um, he wants a full table, <laughs> and he's going to keep his promise in the same way that David kept his promise to Jonathan to provide for his children. God is keeping His promise that all are welcome. Yes. And that all we have, you know, He stands at the door knocking. We just have to open it. Mm -hmm. We just have to get to the table. Mm -hmm. And boy, that's going to be a good table to be at. Yes. Thanks for listening and journeying with us on this side of the ceiling. See you next time.